Well before the current era of so-called fake news and alternative facts, John Pilger was engaged in intellectual self-defense, to use Noam Chomsky's term. John's passionate dedication to exposing the abuse of power is really legendary, internationally legendary. It's thanks to him and other fearless independent journalists that we've been made aware of the dark secrets of governmental and corporate power, and that we're able to peer beneath the veneer of mainstream media reporting. He says, I thank and commend John for the books, documentaries, articles, and commentaries that continue to hold to account those who willfully pursue their own interests at the expense of others, and those who are indifferent to social justice and human rights. In an era of rising ethno-nationalism, deranged corporate power, cruelty and indifference, we need the John Pilgers of this world more than ever. Yes. yes. I'm Mick O'Regan and I'm from Bangalore. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you tonight to be with me in hearing from John Pilger, who's going to continue a career of truth-telling. And if ever we were in a dearth of truth-telling, it would seem to be now. As Pratima indicated, fake news, alternative facts, there's a bevy of words now being used to basically describe lies. Well, tonight, as we meet in the Cavern Bar Centre, and locals will know that in the, in the language of the Bunjalung Nation, Cavern Bar means meeting place, what we're going to be doing is trying to end that sorry business of mistruth, distortion and deception, and hear from someone who's made it his career, his life interest, to try and tell the truth. We're meeting to listen to a man who has unstintingly chronicled both the corruption and failure of government and corporations, and at the same time has relentlessly pushed not only the public's fundamental right to know, but forcing authorities to release information that we do have a right to know. John Pilger is the product of the coalfields of the Hunter Valley, and with a father who was actually in the Australian chapter of the International Workers of the World. He had a wobbly dad. He had imbibed progressive ideas from the knee. But the story that I love, and I've heard John tell it a couple of times in some of the, the videos that I've looked at, at one point as a young boy, he asked his mother, what's, what's our line? What's the, the family's political view? And his mother succinctly told him, we're on the side of the underdog. And as we know, that's where John Pilger has stayed. Through a storied career in print, documentary filmmaking and television, John Pilger has revealed the hidden, clarified the deceptive and identified responsibility. He is a journalist who truly has spoken truth to power. Please make him welcome at the Cavern Bar Centre John Pilger. Thank you. Thank you for coming out in such generous numbers tonight. I appreciate it enormously and Thank you, Mick. Tonight, what I'd like this to be is what they used to call a forum, I suppose, a Q&A where we discuss things and um, you ask questions and I'll attempt to answer or we open up 
uh, a discussion. Um, so I'm going to start with um, just a quick illustration, I suppose, of probably the central theme of what I'm going to be talking about, and that's propaganda. Um, I'm referring back to 1982 to uh, an appeal judgment by one of Australia's greatest jurists, uh, the High Court Judge Lionel Murphy, who was, uh, it's about the case of an Aboriginal man, Mr. Neil, who was jailed by a magistrate who called him an agitator, a stirrer. Uh, and uh, Lionel Murphy took this case as a way of expressing a basic principle of freedom and democracy by quoting Oscar Wilde. Agitators, wrote Wilde, are a set of interfering, meddling people who sow the seeds of discontent among the contented. <laughs> That's the reason agitators are so absolutely necessary. Without them, the world would not advance towards a civilization, unquote. And uh, Lionel Murphy described Mr. Neil as an agitator, and of course he won the appeal. So I said, this, this is about propaganda. Now, much of propaganda is opposed to agitation. Agitation is the voice of freedom. And it just so happens, it's almost always the case, that in the mostly Murdoch-owned Northern Star this morning, I learned that you're harboring terrorists here. <laughs> Farmers fear vegan terrorists. <laughs> now there's a large picture, portrait picture, and wondering who it is, but it's a cow. Uh, and there are a couple of chooks here as well. And private property, trespassers. Pro this is propaganda. You read the story inside, and it's all about these dreadful vegan uh, activists who are reminding the world, and I'm not a vegan, I have to say, but who are reminding the world that uh, uh, killing creatures uh, is something highly morally questionable and not particularly good for our environment. And of course, down came the Murdoch Northern Star on it. Uh, but that's pretty, I would think that's part of the course for, particularly for anything, any newspaper influenced by, by Murdoch. In the 1970s, I met one of the most notorious propagandists in the world, certainly in modern times, Lenny Riefenstahl, close friend of Adolf Hitler, whose films helped cast the Nazi, the, the, the Nazi spell over Germany. She told me that the messages in her films, the propaganda, was dependent not on orders from above, as she put it, but on what she called the submissive void of the public. I asked her, did that submissive void include the liberal, educated bourgeoisie? Almost everyone, she said, especially the intelligentsia, the middle class when people no longer ask serious questions, they are submissive. I would add to that when people no longer agitate, as Mr. Neil did, they are submissive. But this is 2019. 
There are no jackfoot boots in the streets. This is Australia. Why then do we tolerate propaganda almost every time we open a newspaper, almost every time we turn on TV, almost every time we scroll through the news sites on that device that we often hold like rosary beads? <laughs> At Nuremberg, where the Nazis were tried for war crimes, the prosecutor, the Allied prosecutor, said this of the German media, and I quote him. Before every major aggression, they initiated a campaign to weaken their victims to prepare the German people psychologically for war. In the propaganda system, it was the press and radio that were the most important weapons, there's no TV." Unquote. That's what happened in Australia, in Britain, in the United States, before the invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Serbia, and many more. They too were crimes under the Nuremberg Standard. In Iraq, a million people died as a result. Four million people became refugees, set that figure against the few who tried to reach Australia by boat. The question is, how did they get away with the lies, the propaganda? That's a question for all of you here. Why have we allowed a rampant bully across the Pacific to dictate the way we see the world? War in the Middle East? No problem, boss. Move our embassy to Jerusalem? No worries, mate. <laughs> Threaten China? We're on the case, board. Today, intimidate Chinese in Australia? Yes, sir. Recognize a fake president in Venezuela? Consider it done. <laughs> Today, the world's great powers come in three categories. 21st century, 20th century, and 19th century. The United States is a 19th century power with a clear 19th century objective to rule over all of humanity. I wish I was being ironic. Australia is a vassal of this anachronism, but why? Why have we never been independent? Why, as Manning Clark described so graphically, was Federation merely a plea for the Royal Navy to continue to protect us? To be fair, <coughs> we have achieved this 19th century sort of hangers-on status in our own right. The biggest exploiters of Africa's mining riches today are not American, not British, not French, but Australians. 140 Australian companies are digging up the poorest continent, plundering its coal. They'll make billions. Africa didn't have a carbon emissions problem. Now it does with our help. <clears throat> Here at home, here at home, why has the corporate world and its bullshit language and bullshit culture contaminated almost everything? Politics, education, the workplace, media, the arts, online, offline. A new managerial class has arisen to ensure that workers and the rest of us process this bullshit. All of it invented in the United States 50 years ago to ensure the dominance of notorious multinational corporations like AT&T, which are totalitarian and have no place in real democracies. What happened to Fair Go? Has it any meaning now? Or is it just an advertising cliché like the lucky country, but without the irony. 
In the 1960s, Australia had the most equitable spread of income on earth. Today, 1% of the population control more wealth than the vast majority of Australians. Why? Why do we allow one man, Chris Corrigan, notorious for union busting, to own more water than anyone in this country? Corrigan's company, Webster's Limited, and another fat cat, Peter Harris, effectively control 70% of the Murray-Darling between them and use our precious resource for their profit. <clears throat> they actually sell our water back to the federal government and receive millions under a taxpayer-funded buyback deal. Who negotiated this, uh, this deal? None other than Barnaby Joyce when he was Minister for Water. And to which party does Corrigan's and uh, and, and Harris's, Corrigan's and Harris's uh, fortunes go to to support the National Party. That's how our democracy works. How do they get away with it? I once interviewed the acclaimed Czech novelist, Dubánek, while he was under house arrest in Prague. His books were banned. It was a grim time. He told me something that took me by surprise. He said, and I quote, those who live in totalitarian states are at a great advantage <coughs> over you in the West. Why? Because we suffer no illusions. We know our media lies to us. We know it reflects the ideology of power. But unlike you, we have learned to read between the lines. Your problem in the West is that you have never learned to read between the lines. You believe the BBC. You believe the TV news. You believe the newspapers. And yet your propaganda is essentially the same as ours. A little more subtle, perhaps, but not much." Unquote. I grew up in the Cold War heavily influenced by Hollywood. I learned that war was a game of good people, us, and bad people, them. Asians were sinister, black people were servile, Americans were heroes, the winners, the best. They were so good our politicians declared us honorary Americans. Looking back, it all seemed so puerile, but it worked. It was only much later when I witnessed real war did I realize how successful the propaganda of my upbringing had been. It was only when I stood in front of the shadow of a woman burned into the steps of a bank in Hiroshima, her human form vaporized in seconds. It was only when I met the victims of nuclear weapons and heard their stories and stood at ground zero in Japan on Bikini Island and at Maralinga in South Australia did I fully appreciate how high were the stakes of propaganda and its lies. It was only when I saw trees festering with pieces of body, blown there by bombs dropped from 30,000 feet on peasant villages, did I understand how important it was to recognize the utter ruthlessness of great power and to reject its lies, regardless of whether that power called itself a democracy. If you Google the term brainwashing, it says brainwashing was carried out by the Chinese communists during the Korean War to instill their propaganda into allied prisoners. There's no mention of the most successful brainwashing of all, the denial of the Korean War as genocide, the annihilation of all the major cities of Korea by American bombers, all the major cities, the killing of millions of people when Korea's dikes were bombed, 
was an historic crime carried out with our government's approval. At the time, did we know? All we knew was that the Reds were bad and we were good and the diggers were over there. That's brainwashing. And we still don't know. Today, this denial of history is referred to as the Forgotten War. The Korean people, of course, have not forgotten. Go to Jeju Island in the south of Korea and look at the death mass. Listen to the stories. A third of the population was slaughtered under American instructions. That's why they want to unite North and South. That's why they want peace. When Donald Trump met Kim Jong-un, there was no mention of what America had done to that country. Not far from Korea, not far from Korea, is the Japanese island of Okinawa, where today missile, nuclear missile silos stand silent. In 1962, the order was given to fire nuclear weapons at Korea and China. It was a mistake. The action of a madman, they said. Out of pure luck, the order was rescinded. It was that close, and we didn't know. Today, Okinawa is one big American base, the people fenced in by bombers and weapons, and at China. Australia is still there, silent, unquestioning, the Australian warship HMAS Adelaide <clears throat> has on it US Marines embedded, waiting for the order to invade. In the last three years, China has changed its nuclear policy from low alert to high alert. They're preparing to defend themselves. Do we know that? They're worried, I was told when I was last in China, they're frightened. Are we? Has Hollywood changed since my Saturday matinees at the Bondi Road Hoyts long ago? Oh yes. Movies with ethnic diversity and gender balance are all the rage. They win Oscars. But is the message, the propaganda, any different? Currently, the biggest box office smash is Captain Marvel, which is pure state-sponsored warmongering propaganda. What matters, say the critics, is that Captain Marvel is a woman. <laughs> On International Women's Day, Women's Day, Chelsea Manning was thrown into prison because she refused to lie and to incriminate Julian Assange. Unlike Captain Marvel, Chelsea Manning is a true American hero. Who speaks up for Chelsea? Who demands Chelsea is freed? Julian Assange is a true Australian hero, betrayed and deserted by his government, who speaks up for Julian? Who demands he is freed? The public service Julian Assange has performed, supporting truth tellers all over the world and empowering people, is unprecedented. Without WikiLeaks, millions of people would not know about the secret plans and lies of oppressive regimes and democratic governments. Julian now lives on a knife edge in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Whenever I visit him, we become like characters in George Orwell's 1984, spied upon, intimidated. The Australian government has had every opportunity to bring Julian home, but has betrayed him in its obsequiousness to America and Britain. Where are Julian's fellow Australians?
demanding that his government protect him? That's a question for all of us here tonight. Where are you? Yeah. Right here. The same question. The same question. A perennial question. Might be asked every day by Indigenous Australians. Where are you? The most heroic Australians I have known are Indigenous. Rob Riley, Vincent Lingiari, Robert Eggington, Selina Eggington, Kevin Gilbert, Puggy Hunter, Gary Foley, Michael Anderson, Bobby Randall, Arthur Murray, Leela Murray, and many more. In the week after the heroic Aboriginal freedom fighter Arthur Murray died in Wee War, New South Wales, I looked on Google Australia for tributes, and all I could find was a 1991 obituary of an American ballroom instructor of the same name. There was nothing, not a word, in the Australian media. The Australian newspaper on that day published a large rictal image of its owner, Rupert Murdoch, handing out awards to his employees. Arthur would have understood the irony and the silence. The question tonight is, when will we take responsibility for both our past and our present? In the first three months of this year, 2019, 38 Indigenous people have committed suicide, a record. The youngest was 12 years old. We incarcerate young Aboriginal men at a higher rate than apartheid South Africa imprisoned black people during its last decade. Do we know that? Are we aware of that? In New South Wales, the state government just returned, led by the first elected female premier, as they keep telling us, has brought in adoption laws likely to create another stolen generation. Do we know that? When the truth is replaced by silence, said the Russian dissident poet Yevtushenko, the silence is a lie. The government and security agencies of Australia are now fully integrated with the United States in its permanent war on the rest of humanity. They bomb, we bomb. They kill, we kill. They subvert, we subvert. The largest numbers of victims of terrorism, mostly Western state terrorism, are Muslims. The, church, the Christchurch massacre was business as usual. The Australian killer in Christchurch had all the inspiration he needed from the words and actions of John Howard, Tony Abbott, Peter Dutton, Scott Morrison. Australian special forces and mercenaries are all over the Middle East, as they are all over Afghanistan and Iraq, as they are all over Southeast Asia. Last year, the RAAF helped to blow the ancient city of Mosul to bits. We now know that Australian troops preempted the criminal invasion of Iraq in 2003, which led to the deaths of a million people. On the 25th of April, Aussie diggers will celebrate Anzac Day in Saudi Arabia, and quite possibly in Yemen where 85,000 children have died from malnutrition and where Christopher Pine's military equipment ends up courtesy of the Saudi medievalists. Are we aware of this? Do we know? The United Nations says that unless the Saudi invasion of Yemen is halted, and I quote, there will be famine in Yemen, the largest famine the world has seen in modern times. This announcement had no discernible effect on Australian policy. 
A few days before Mark Lokoff, the UN official, made his speech, the ever-smiling Pine was in Saudi Arabia selling arms. An Australian firm called Electro Optic Systems has received $36 million from his government for a remotely operated platform that fires missiles, machine guns, you name it. It's brilliant for slaughtering civilians. The same firm has received $410 million to send military exports <coughs> to the United Arab Emirates, where an Australian general commands the Presidential Guard, silence. To quote Harold Pinter, it never happened. Nothing ever happened. Even while it was happening, it wasn't happening. It was of no interest. It didn't matter. Unquote. What a laugh they had in Parliament when Christopher Pine made his jocular farewell speech the other day no mention of the timing that Pine's $200,000 ministerial pension was assured. No mention of his legacy, the children of Yemen. So roll on Anzac Day. In the airport bookshops, the glorification of war is our showcase of bullshit. Apparently General Monash won the First World War. What an Aussie legend. There are books on China, our new enemy, rather the enemy we've been instructed to have. Peter Harcher at the Sydney Morning Herald once suggested combating this new enemy with a hygiene campaign that eradicated, and I quote, rats, flies, mosquitoes, and sparrows. Vermin, in other words. This week's ABC Four Corners tried to convince us, again, that China was subverting the Australian political system. It was reminiscent of the same program's fake drama that Donald Trump was a Russian agent. How can China buy a country that is already subverted and sold to the United States? When will the ABC have the guts to tell that story? I hope these thoughts will open up discussion tonight and perhaps raise other questions, such as, why have we abandoned a proud labor history as part of our popular heritage? Who remembers Sunday too far away? Why is the scholarship of industrial democracy drowned in a torrent of American invented MBAs with their litanies of greed? Why has identity politics taken hold of much of the Australian bourgeoisie and the gatekeepers of our culture? The artistic director of the Sydney Writers' Festival refers to a post-truth world. What on earth does she mean? Her festival includes barely a single item that touches on the urgent questions raised here tonight. In 1902, the Act of Parliament that extended the franchise to women also included the following, and I quote, no Aboriginal native of Australia, Asia, Africa, or the islands of the Pacific except New Zealand shall be given the vote." Unquote. In other words, the very legislation that gave women the vote in Australia pointedly excluded any woman and man of colour. What that says, I think, is that none of us are truly free until all of us are free. And that what matters above all is not your gender, not your race, not your sexual preference, but the class you serve. 
I look forward to your questions. And you may well ask, what can be done? Or preempt that. <laughs> That's up to you. James Baldwin wrote these words. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Thank you. That notion that we have to transform the submissive void, and you did say to us that it's up to us, but in your experience, where do you see really effective popular action that confronts governmental and corporate abuse? Well, we, we do see effective action all the time. We must never uh, diminish the importance of that. I mean, not far away, we, we saw wonderful success recently uh, over the, uh, I think it's called the Rocky Hill Mine in Gloucester, where uh, a group of, uh, of, of campaigners uh, took the coal mining company, uh, a kind of small version of Adani, took them to the, uh, the Land uh, and uh, Environment Court, I think it's called, and, and, and won an historic judgment. Uh, the judge, for the first time, said that the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, a coal mine of this nature and of this, of this size could have the most devastating effect on climate change. And uh, the, the mining company lost. Mm. And seeing their reaction, they're absolutely speechless. Now, I mentioned that that only happened about a week ago. I found that so cheery and not untypical of, 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 uh, of community groups that don't wring their hands but understand the political realities, understand the court system as well and how that can be uh, addressed and won at, and they won. So, uh, there are many, there are many other cases. Indeed, come to mind. Indeed. Your latest movie is called The Coming War on China. So I'm wondering really, are we anticipating a war on China? We're spending 106 million a day and 38 billion a year on military investment. And yeah. so have you, has there been any new developments since you completed your movie on that topic? Thank you. Yes. Well, I made that film, and the film was finished, actually just as Trump was being elected in November 2016. And it's one that I've wanted to make for many years, having spent a lot of time in Asia reporting from there. Um, and I felt that drift uh, had been accelerated. Uh, under Obama. Obama really got it going when he uh, announced what was called the pivot to Asia, which in fact meant the biggest build-up of American forces and naval forces in the Pacific since the Second World War. Uh, and the American national, what I should call the American National Security Establishment, whatever, they decided that <clears throat> they have two main enemies, of course, Russia and China, but China was the one that threatened them economically, truly threatened their dominance. It's now touch and go, which is the biggest economic power in, in, uh, in the world. Uh, what is truly threatening for the United States is China's rapid advances in technology, the fact that they're, they're, they will They've mastered 5G's. Uh, the whole campaign against Huawei is, is an act of war. Mm. The, the arrest of a, a senior company executive in Canada. Uh, ironically, and you do not read this, nothing about it, there's no back door 
in Huawei equipment. They're offering it, backdoor I mean, for the NSA. Uh, there are plenty of so-called backdoors in all the others, the apples and the rest, where you, know, you have to listen to Edward Snowden on how we can be watched through our devices. But Huawei presents a challenge to this universal surveillance and this, this dominates. That's, that's the latest. Uh, that America has many powers still. It's not waning as it's so often portrayed. Uh, it has been equaled and passed, but what it does have is its military power. Uh, and I've always regarded American military power as, in my experience with it, as, uh, uh, as extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. Uh, it will go to a point of risk that other great powers won't go to. Uh, and I think the difference between the new Cold War, which is clearly underway now, and the old Cold War, in the old Cold War, they were, they were literally red lines. You didn't cross, you didn't, you didn't invade East or West Berlin. You, di you didn't come up to the Russian border, the Soviet border. Uh, there was buffers all around uh, the, the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, those red lines have gone now. And uh, I'm not a futurist. I don't know whether there is actually a coming war with, 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 between China and Russia, but certainly I do know, uh, and I suppose that's what shocked me finding this out in China, is how rapidly they are preparing for it. Now, when great states prepare for war, it doesn't, the, the act of deliberate warfare is the least likely the thing to happen. It's a mistake or accident. Um, and there's almost no, there's no discourse, there's no discussion about this. There was much more during the old Cold War about this. There's none now about the, the fine line that we're approaching between great powers. Uh, and particularly now between the United States and the most uh, reluctant enemy of all, China. The reason China is prosperous is it didn't want to make the mistakes the Soviet Union did, it was join in an arms race. So it wanted to economically build itself into great economic power. It's now being forced to go into that. So, it's a precarious situation, and again, I suppose, as I've mentioned tonight already, we just need to know and to understand this, and we need to look past the media that is, that is uh, offered to us as propaganda. But I'm curious what you believe about strategies for change, and I'm wondering what you think of the adage that the master's house will not be destroyed by the master's tool and what your thoughts are about strategies and tactics. The person asking the question is very interested in, in the notion of uh, your thoughts on, on strategy and what options there are for change. And you used the quote that the, the master's house is never destroyed by the master's tools. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. The master's house is very likely to be destroyed by the master's tools. Uh, you know, Trump was now uh, signed off on a trillion dollar uh, nuclear warheads uh, program. Uh, they're getting to a point of, of critical, of uh, critical, sort of, uh, uh, a mass, I suppose, with the development of nuclear weapons, that uh, the destruction is total. Uh, I just divert slightly and suggest for a quick catch-up, which, as we don't seem to read much about this or hear much about this, read Neville Shute's book again, <laughs> On the Beach. It's absolutely brilliant. I saw a documentary the other day, Australian documentary called Fallout, about the film. 
uh, and the finality of what Shute so brilliantly described in that book uh, includes the master's house and includes all the enemy's houses as well. In strategy, I mean, the strategy has to come from us. We can't uh, lobotomize trade generals in the Pentagon saying, will you now please go to Byron Bay and do something very nice and interesting and stop doing all these war-making things you're doing. You can't do that. That's not on. Could they fix Airbnb? Airbnb. But we, we, we can produce the thing that great power fears. If I've learned nothing, I've learned this. The great power fears the movement of people. Always. That's why it spends so much treasure and energy and, and, and uh, uh, expertise in trying to deceive and lie and manipulate people. You know, um, um, it, the general, uh, the general who was in charge of Afghanistan for a long time, the American general, said that to him it wasn't the, the Taliban that was the, 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 uh, the, his main concern. It was the media. That's what mattered, the media, to win the media, to, I suppose, defeat the media in a sense. He didn't have to try very hard, but, you know, uh, defeat the media. And it's, it's, the, it's, so in other words, they fear great movements and great popular movements uh, have scored huge successes in the past. The freeze movement of the 1980s filled the streets of Manhattan uh, against the deployment of nuclear weapons, short-range nuclear weapons in Europe. Right across in Europe, from Greenham Common right through Germany, people in their thousands, the original Green movement, Green Party effectively came from Germany, in my view, really based itself on that. Uh, and those weapons were withdrawn. It's, it's those movements, not waiting around for parliamentary collaborators, and that's all they are, you know, Bill Shorten to <laughs> stop being Bill Shorten, or Jenny Wong, who I think has said that Yemen, the most she said about Yemen, that it's an unfortunate humanitarian situation. Nothing about the fact that Australia sells so many arms that he used them. We don't wait around for them. We build, you, we build movements. And that's what's missing today. That's what's missing. Barack Obama's great achievement was to defuse the anti-war movement in the United States. That was his single achievement, actually. He, apart from a few, his seven wars and a few other things but, that come with the job. But uh, that's, and they have to be rebuilt. Uh, certain triumphs, single triumphs, are very, very important because they can trigger others and bring people together. But we have much to learn from the, the so-called underdeveloped world. Look at the numbers that are marshaled in India. We barely read about these amazing movements of people fighting, uh, not always successfully, but fighting for their rights, their work rights, and their life rights, their human rights. But we, we, there is an assemblance of that in Australia. We've got to build it. So my question is, yep. if I am to galvanise the support yep. of the of people in general, um, and I want to use the media to extend the reach of my communication, who is there? So have you got that? So the woman's asking, who, who in the media can we turn to with progressive ideas? to galvanise popular enthusiasm and to prompt action? No one. 
lesson, lesson one is to cast off all illusions and to stop banging our heads against the media brick wall and to say, oh, isn't it, isn't it terrible? Aren't they terrible? I used a couple of examples just to illustrate what I was saying, but I would, I would, be, I would be remiss if I suggested to you anyway. I know good people in the media, but they work within institutions uh, that prevent them from doing what you're quite rightly suggesting. Uh, and I think what you have to do, we have to do, all of us have to do, is to circumvent the media. When I made a film a few years ago in Utopia about uh, indigenous people, I sort of uh, took a deep breath when I brought it to Australia because I could just see the kind of reception it was going to get in the so-called mainstream media. Uh, so with my colleagues I set about working out a strategy that we could circumvent the media, get it directly to people, get it directly to country towns, get it directly to communities, get it directly to people, uh, to go round the media, to ignore them. We had, we had the premiere of that film, had four and a half thousand people on the block in Redfern and not a word in the media, not a word on television. And that sort of proved the point. But what really proved the point was the numbers who turned up. And again, I say that I think you, my view is, uh, and others may disagree, but my view is, is that you, you, you have to drop the whole idea that there is somebody in the media who will pick this up. Uh, it may be happen quickly, there may be one program, one good radio program, one good radio documentary, as it, turn, as it turns out, I saw last night on television an ABC documentary, I think, called Employ Me, about disabled people. I thought it was a very fine piece of work. Uh, so I, I look, I look for the, I look for the, the director of this program, but they. The, 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 the credits were cut off before I could, and I'll find out uh, because I'd like to write to the director and congratulate him or her. <coughs> but that's an aberration. That's an aberration, and you can't depend on that. You can certainly, I would say, recommend him or her, most certainly, because here is clearly an intelligent, sympathetic voice on a particular subject, but generally speaking, you can't anymore. Uh, I think, I, I describe it this way, I've spent all my career in the mainstream media, uh, and I, when I started, I suppose, in, I started here, I started in Sydney, and then I went to London, but at that time in, in, in London, where my career, newspaper career began, there were wide open spaces in hostile areas of the media for, for uh, dissenting, if you like, dissenting views, honest reporting, objective reporting, not simply the voice of the proprietor. Those spaces have closed. And that's true here. Here it's more difficult because the newspaper business is still controlled, absolutely controlled, if not directly controlled, certainly influenced by the major newspaper proprietor, River Merlin. Uh, and so understanding that 
and not depending on it, not putting in all your precious time and energy and resources into trying to find somebody who will do that, I think it's very important uh, to make it yourself. There are plenty of other platforms now to, for good documentary, good films, to perhaps they don't reach the same audience at the same time, but there are many other ways of doing it, and I think you have to explore those. I'm wondering if, if the move for Brexit, the movement of the yellow vests in France in any way recommends a break with the propaganda, with the orthodox narrative presented by neoliberalism, austerity, governments in Europe, and um, yeah, Britain and so on. Thanks. Yeah. Did you get that? Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, look, I think Brexit is a bad thing that you mentioned. Brexit is a is a, is a is probably about the best example of of, of propaganda. Uh, who can understand it? God knows. But it's 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 difficult enough to understand because there is no tent. There is no tent for right from the moment that that referendum happened in June 2016. Right from the moment uh, the, the propaganda set in. At the moment, the caricatures are that the, the majority of Britons are racist, uh, that all they want is the flag again, all they want is sovereignty, and they, they uh, defer to the spirit of a, uh, a lunatic called Nigel Farage. That's absolute rubbish. Brexit, the vote, was a protest vote and an honourable protest vote. It was the most rawest act of democracy that we've seen in a Western democracy for a very, very long time. <laughs> there, was, there's, there was no seats, no gerrymandering, no cam was campaigning, of course, but there was, there was, there was no personalities involved. There were two words, leave or remain, and you voted for one or the other. Uh, and leave didn't win by a great deal. So yes, the country is divided in a sense. But the propaganda that hit the day after that, when the result was through, by an outraged metropolitan class in London, which controls so much of Britain, Outrage uh, and really going very, very close to 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 calling the the, the, the peasants of revolted, which in one sense they had. The difference was that in the the the, the Brexit vote weren't all working class people by any means. They were people squeezed in the middle, uh, a, a kind of often a, 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 a middle class, a new middle class, not necessarily a lower middle class, a new middle class. There were whole areas of the country where the majority voting were multi-ethnic people. Uh, now there's undoubtedly, uh, I suppose, race as such play a role because in parts of Britain, particularly northern England, where whole zero wage groups of people brought over from Eastern Europe were brought over by one contractor into an economically devastated town and, and at very cheap wages uh, took the jobs, literally took the jobs, that the few jobs that were there. Uh, a friend of mine described this in the town of South Shields once a bustling industrial city devastated. The austerity, so-called austerity, this awful word, which used to be an honourable word, uh, that has been imposed on Britain by this extreme government, series of extreme governments, uh, whereby the uh, people have, for instance, local councils, in Britain, local government, which I'm sure you know, is responsible for so many services. 
they've had their, their budgets cut by 40 to 50 percent, just like that. Disabled people, children, protection of children, all those vital services that come locally, there's no money for them. This was a protest on multiple levels. It had very little to do about sovereignty. Farage and his nutters were thrown out at the, the following year in the general election. And the, so the propaganda continues. So we, we have to read in the Sydney Morning Herald, I, I don't know why I read it, but I do, but I, why do I read it? Because <laughs> you don't want to read it's it. It's an admission. <laughs> <laughs> I need something to go with my brand flakes or something. <laughs> brand flakes you don't need anything to go with, but I don't need the Herald. Uh, but the, you know, uh, that this is the most stupid thing that ever happened. It was actually an act of democracy and a confused one. And it's been let down badly by a Labour leader in whom great hope was invested, but who's gone out of his way to appease his enemies, to, uh, to allow into his, what he calls his broad tent, uh, so many of his enemies. Uh, and the vote, really, was the people speaking. Uh, I don't know where it's going now, uh, I can't tell, and I, like almost everybody, can't work out what the various deals involved and, and what the parliamentary votes mean altogether. But at the heart of it was a people, a majority people, a slim majority, but a majority, voting as a protest not to go to Europe, Europe which has destroyed Greece, in Greece they had a referendum which said we want to get out because we don't want the German Central Bank, we don't want all these, the, uh, the Brussels bureaucracy to impose all these restrictions on us and its government betrayed them. And Greece was effectively made a vassal of Brussels. Uh, the, the, the similar things happened in Portugal, in Spain, the uh, uh, the Euro has been an absolute disaster. It has meant that Germany and France have currency. Why did Britain stay out of the Euro and keep the power? Because it knew what a disaster it was going to be. Uh, so, I can't... Yes, yes, the, as part of, as part of the European experience has been the elevation of, of certain human rights, but, you know, they've been pretty well lost in all of this. Uh, Macron behaves like a sort of little king uh, and sends his police in to bash people over the head when they protest and so on. I remember Europe before, uh, before the EU and it was, a, I didn't have any trouble going from country to country. Uh, it was very interesting, they all had different currencies. And, it was just Europe, wonderful. Uh, and you have people now saying, that's the end of it. We, in Europe, is, we'll have nothing where, as if we're being, Britain is being hauled off to uh, some remote island near Iceland. We'll never, never, anyway, there, there we are. That's propaganda. <laughs> That's as good as it gets on Brexit. Um, please, just start. Thank you. Could you please comment on this um, 5G mobile phone system, the effect of mobile phone towers on people's health, and the effect on the minds of children who have been constantly using these mobile phones and computers? Is this part of the political agenda, please? Well... I'm the least person, really, I suppose. <laughs> I have to, okay, here's full disclosure. I don't own a mobile phone. <laughs> now, that doesn't make me a trackless monk, I can tell you. <laughs> but 
I know because I don't own one because if I did own one, I'd be absolutely addicted to the thing. And I'm, I've, it, it's a conscious decision. I don't need it. I've got communication going all over the place, so I don't need a mobile. But anyway. I d I'm sorry, I'm not up with the later studies on the effect of mobile holding a mobile phone to your head. Uh, it always seems advisable to me with any uh, device like that to be hands-free, but I don't know is the answer. Uh, the effect on children, I think, is, I mean, it must be for modern parents extremely difficult because there are now so many transcendent forces, powers that go over them that influence their children to which they have to respond. Uh, having the phone, uh, what they do with the phone must be, a, must, must be something that re requires parental authority that may be difficult in circumstances, particularly if the family is not together. Uh, and, and so mobile phone becomes then uh, something of a weapon. Uh, it can also be very useful, of course, extremely useful for people getting people out of trouble, we know that. Um, but it, 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 that terrible word regulation it's not a terrible word, it's an honourable word, and we need it. We need it in relation to mobile phones, and certainly we, we try and protect children and are outraged about, about the terrible things that have happened to children. We need to protect them from, from technology and, and the vast money-making powers that really run technology. Uh, so again, that is up to us. Thank you, John. Can you give us some examples of uh, places in the world that are not using the super surveillance of Facebook and the, the internet, where they've been able to organise civil action outside of that, and, and what, what avenues there are for people to take democracy and power of our own vote and knowledge back into our hands? And can you kind of nominate examples? where people can operate outside the, the super surveillance systems and can actually organise in, in practical, meaningful ways? Is that actually Civil action. Yeah. Civil, civil action. Uh, are, there, are there examples of people kind of outside the, the all-encompassing gaze of technology? I don't think we have to worry too much about that. I think the thing is to organise the civil action. Yeah. Yeah. You know, worry, worry about that. Worry about that when you organise the civil action. When, when outside you've got tens of thousands of people all ready to go. Uh, they'll have a power of their own. Social media is very useful for organising uh, uh, civil action. And of course, uh, and of course, there's going to be some. Surveillance is a given. You can't avoid it. I can't avoid it by not having it. I, I, you know, I've had, you know, my, my uh, landline has been worked over and tapped and house broken into and various other things to find out uh, what I could have told them happily. Uh, but if you had a mobile phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Perhaps a, perhaps a mobile phone salesman, you know. Um, but, uh, so, the surveillance is a fact. You know, we have a great thing called the Five Eyes. Echelon has been around since the 80s. Basically, there's a huge vacuum cleaner that, if it wants to, can find out everything about it. Uh, we have one of the most advanced uh, listing posts on Earth and that Pine Gap. Uh, if we worry about that, we just will be paralysed. Uh, what matters is the civil action. Mm -hmm.
If you could please send your message of your experience to the National Assembly and Jose Valencia and the Cancilleria of Ecuador about whether these three things are true. One, the claim that uh, Ecuador has offered the best treatment, humanitarian treatment to Assange, that they have given him full access to the internet throughout his job that he has refused to use it, and that he has had absolute freedom of visitors and that he has had hundreds of them, so that all his statements are false. So what I'm asking you is, and, and that he has absolutely no problem of privacy and that he has breached the protocol and this is why they're going to take away, away his asylum. Would you please give us a refresher so that we can send this videotape tomorrow, I mean tonight, to Ecuador? Could you please tell us what is your experience about his pri privacy, about his internet, <laughs> about his surveillance, about his visitors, and about his humanitarian treatment? Okay. Under uh, uh, President Pereira, Ecuador did offer and give uh, that uh, safe place for Julian Assange, a small country, a small country which uh, had quite a bit to lose, stood up to great power and gave Julian Assange uh, 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 Asylum. I have to say there that the clincher, and it is legal asylum, it can't be, by the way, there's a protocols, asylum can't be uh, amended. Asylum is asylum. There's an international law that lays down exactly what asylum was. Is and in, 2012, in 2013, when Julian was given asylum, it was largely based on the fact of his abandonment, his abandonment by the Australian government. That is one of the great shames of this country. Uh, he had no refuge back in his homeland. That was a major consideration for the, the international jurists who were considering whether this request as it was by Ecuador to give Julian uh, asylum would be accepted, and it was accepted, as I say, largely on that basis. What has happened in Ecuador uh, is that the Carrero government was uh, uh, defeated, and Carrero was Carrero was effectively hounded out of uh, out of Ecuador. Uh, his number two, Marino, who has turned into more than a Judas, but an extraordinary political figure, who has uh, his own dark past has been revealed, and Julian Assange has become his whipping boy. The whole notion that the Ecuadorian government could impose a series of of petty and not so petty restrictions on Julian is against international law. He had no right to do that. Also to threaten to get rid of Julian, to expel Julian, Julian is against international law. Not only against international law, it's against Ecuadorian law. Because Julian, in the meantime, had got Ecuadorian nationality. He has now dual nationality. Australian and Ecuadorian. No Ecuadorian citizen can be extradited. No extra can be extradited on a political basis as Julian, as they're threatening to do to Julian. So all this has been illegal. What has happened since March 2018, the, the uh, campaign against Julian, uh, the restriction, the taking away of the internet, the restriction of his freedom, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the leaking of, of lies about uh, uh, Julian, the 
And the refusal to, to recognize that it is the responsibility now of the country that has given refuge, given asylum to uh, somebody to negotiate in good faith that asylum with the country in which it has happened, and that is with Britain. Instead, Ecuador and Britain have become collaborators, it appears, collaborators uh, in a, a campaign to expel Chile. Um, if if they do expel Julian, it will be against every law, and they haven't done it so far because they know that. They know that that is the end of Ecuador's reputation, international reputation. It also worries diplomats and others all over the world because it breaks the very spirit of the Vienna Convention, which protects foreigners like diplomats and others, uh, in foreign countries. Um, and, but the, the psychological campaign on Julian has been daily. Uh, and I've witnessed it. And on his health has been daily. Uh, he's a man of the most extraordinary resilience, but his physical health is taking a battery. And it's certainly taking most of a battering since this campaign began. And I'll bring it back away from Ecuador just for a second. Last July, Julie Bishop, who was then the Foreign Minister and her Chief of Staff, flew to London and then they were going on to Washington. And they brought up, they went to the Foreign Office in London. And they brought up, well, it was brought up, of course, Julian Assange. They had, in the, they had with them a letter from Julian's father, a letter I've seen, a most moving letter, saying, John Shipton, his father, was saying, I fear that Julian won't leave that embassy alive. He was so worried about him. Now, this is an Australian citizen. They did nothing. They sat on their hands. Imagine if it was somebody else in some other country. They, they did nothing. They went on to Washington. She saw Pompeo, uh, the Secretary of State. Nothing was said and flew back. And the hopes of a small group that had tried to influence them to just even mention Julian were dashed. Uh, now, to my knowledge, we knew nothing about that. Now, that is a cause of national shame. Uh, and then, what we've seen since then is Bishop parading herself as some kind of feminist icon uh, ac across, across the media, uh, instead of this uh, deferential really disgraceful view. Uh, the Australian government could easily bring Julian home. They could invoke all sorts of international statutes. This is our citizen. He's not charged with anything. He's not guilty of anything. We'll take him. Yes, if there's a bail infringement, we'll talk to you about it. But we're taking him home. That could happen. No question about that. Uh, and in fact, in the discussions around this, without saying so directly, Turnbull implied that that could happen when he was Prime Minister, but nothing happened. Nothing happened. And that is the shame. I want to ask you a question about power, the concept of power. I was thinking of uh, Noam Chomsky's metaphor for you, actually, of saying you were a, a lighthouse in a storm. Um, and for me, that is true. Um, Not quite a lighthouse, but I, I can yeah. fairly say, yeah. Yeah, and um, the, the courage and the experience that you've got is just wonderful to be able to um, share a bit of that. Terrific. Um, if democracy 
is the shift in that story. Is, is there a metaphor, like you talked about truth, I get that, that we're told uh, the outcome is hypocrisy, we're told that they are after the silence and, and that's what their goal is, and they seem to be successful at it at times, other times not. But is there a metaphor for power that we should approach our thinking of how we can move from their idea of power to empowerment for all, rather than bastardising the language? There's imposing power and rapacious power, and there's our power. And I hope I've been referring to our power. And I gave one example of our power, and there are plenty of others, but, you know, history and our history in Australia is littered with the power of people. That's why our labour history is so airbrushed and ignored. When my parents came from the Hunter Valley in, in New South Wales, the Hunter Valley through probably through about 30 years was in uproar as, a, as it fought to establish certain principles of decency and human rights and the working life of people. Uh, I doubt whether that's taught in schools. Uh, the Gurindji people fought the most extraordinary eight years with, with Victor Lingiari touring the country. Uh, eight years against uh, Lord Vesti's uh, uh, monopoly, as it was, uh, uh, which they walked off. Uh, uh, that was, their power was enormous. All they needed was support, and actually in those days they did get support. They picked up support all over Australia. Uh, and there are many other examples. And that's why knowledge is so important. We need to know about these. We need to be reminded of them. We need to be told about them and not through the, the filter of Rupert Murdoch's media. We need that pride that comes from that Australia wasn't simply a servile colony, though in its elite certainly was, uh, that the people of this country have a true tradition. The First World War, which inspired my, my mother to her politics. Uh, the role of women in the, in, the, uh, in the First World War. The reason that Australia didn't send conscripted troops to the First World War is, a, is, a, is a something that is never mentioned on Anzac Day, but should be something that we, we, we would be proud of and the part and the role that women played in that. All of this, this is our history, which we have to reclaim. Uh, and that's down to teachers, it's down to parents, educators, whatever, all of us. Reclaiming that is important, as important as going on the streets. Recently, I went up Asia, and I told them that every, yes, I, I have a direct line, I've got a direct line to Asia. That's the best opening line to any question so far. <laughs> I, the, the, woman, the woman just said that recently she rang Asia. You rang Asia? Yes, <laughs> did, you, was it, did you get a voice? <laughs> yes, I, I ring them up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> they know my name now. Oh, is that you? Oh, good. <laughs> um, yes, so I said, are you aware that every young person that I've spoken to, from students at university to air conditioning installers, believe that 9-11 was not what the official story described and they're angry about it and they are feeling disenfranchised from their government because the government is silent on the matter and they said well what is your evidence that 9-11 
story was not true. I said, well, our pilots for 9-11 Truth, Dr. Judy for 9-11 Truth, physicists, architects and engineer, and ask the grand jury that's being convened in America on 9-11 Truth because it's based on evidence, scientific fraud, not theory. So I gave them my story. Okay, but please come to your question Sure. Now. Why doesn't Julian and why don't you use the 9-11 Truth Movement as an impetus? Because a lot of people are angry about it. Why doesn't he mention it? Is it a dead man's bullet that you've got something that is so amazing? Why, why don't you refer to it? So the woman was asking, why, why don't you bring in the 9-11 Truth Movement and the, and the concerns that apparently so many young people have about the veracity of 9-11 as it's been explained? Why don't you bring that into your uh, the kind of uh, panoply of arguments that you have about power and corruption and, and the lack of truth? Is that? That's true. Well, I, 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 I don't know about the 9-11 truth movement, but I certainly have mentioned often the, uh, all the, the misgivings just of the official report around 9-11. And I've always said to people, go to the official report and read that because uh, that raises so many questions about what happened before 9-11, but particularly what happened immediately afterwards. Um, I, that's, 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 I've raised many times. I think we were suggesting Julian should raise it. Julian, Julian's role, let me make this clear, is a publisher. He publishes uh, uh, material that has been, has been leaked. And if it's material that is authentic, uh, then it's published by WikiLeaks. So it doesn't really fall within, if there was material about 9-11, and I'm trying to think back over the archives of WikiLeaks, uh, I'm sure there must be something in there, uh, it would be published. It, it, or it's all published. Uh, but I don't think it's his remit necessarily will have an opinion on it. I don't know what it is. Uh, my opinion is I've just given you that there are many, many open questions and challenging questions that come from the, uh, the uh, initial report uh, into 9-11. Uh, into but once you enter the truth, the tr as it's known colloquially as the truth movement around 9-11, that's a whole different ball game. And I just wonder, yeah, I wonder if you've looked at the ISDF clauses of the trade treaties. I, I was with Chomsky for a while at MIT, and we used to argue about this. And he said, Helena, you're never going to get a people's movement against free trade. I'm still hoping that we will. Uh, you know, the bankers you know, who went out to China to try China open for global banks and corporations to make out of China a factory. And this is what we now get, the global monster that comes back at us because we allow big business to transform that economy. I'd love to hear what you think about the global economy. Okay. So Helen was asking in relation to the driving mechanism to give the, the way the integrated globalized world economy and the power that it's given to global banks and corporations to effectively force governments to sign treaties that simply protect yeah. the profits of those organisations. And that integrated economic activity has kind of rolled out the red carpet for international banks and corporations to, to deny sovereignty, to work against local trade, to create an environment that's effectively anti-democratic. Is that reasonable? Yeah. Is that that's the question. That's the question. Yeah. And what's your well, thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think there's a, I think that's by and right, but there's a bit of a myth there that governments are the victims of multinational corporations. No, they're not. 
there's something called a revolving door that goes between the government and into and into the multinational corporations. Uh, and uh, when you have uh, in the United States the breathtaking uh, uh, power of the, the lobbyists on behalf of huge multinational corporations, when you see that close up, they're one and the same. They're one and the same. They go in and out of government. Government are there. So yes, there is a civil service, but I mean, I know in Britain, what was once an independent civil service is now the product of a revolving door between the world of multinationals, the world of very powerful companies, uh, and the world of government. So it's all one and the same. Governments are not victims. Governments are not being forced to do anything. Governments actually have huge power. Um, you know, uh, I, I've forgotten who it was, but uh, uh, you know, American, the American system is, is socialism for the rich and capitalism for the poor. Uh, and that's what it is. That's what it always has been. Everything from agri-power through to the, uh, all the uh, so-called defense assistant, assisted industries, uh, technology, are massively, massively government-supported in, 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 in a way that would, would make any true blue, if there is one, pure capitalist blush. Uh, it's, it's, governments are the backbone of neoliberalism. The absolute backbone. Without governments, they are the prop, not more than the prop. They can run the show. That's why the hysteria in Britain that Jeremy Corbyn may be uh, elected is, is quite something to behold. We had recently soldiers, British soldiers, in, in Afghanistan firing at targets with Corbyn's face on it, with generals saying that they can't, uh, they can't guarantee the uh, allegiance of the armed forces if Corbyn comes to help. The whole establishment is in panic, unnecessarily, I have to say, and completely unnecessarily, but they're in panic. There's a mild social democrat who wants to bring in a few uh, decent changes to the economy, but otherwise. But the, the idea that the system of neoliberalism that exists as a partnership between governments and multinational corporations might be challenged strikes true fear into uh, in, into those who who run it. So um, it's I think it's almost governments both need to be the object of the ire of great movements, but governments first. Uh, the recent um, protests in France and riots and so forth. Um, it seems that the government's almost scared of the people. And in Australia here, it's almost the opposite. We're, we're scared of the government. What, what's in our psyche? I hear you talking about Julian Assange, and we could do so much more. It is that we all, we're, we're quite aware about the situation, but we don't seem to act on it like safe friends. Well, you know, we have acted on it in the past. I, I'm not one to analyse our psyche. Yes, of course, the geography makes a difference. Uh, this actually, which also makes the whole notion of China as our enemy absurd. This is the safest country on earth. It has no enemies. Uh, it's parked in the southern part of the world. Uh, it's surrounded on all sides by oceans. What's the problem? <laughs> uh, it's ridiculous. Yes, there was a worry 
during the Second World War, but I think all the, all the documents now show the Japanese weren't going to invade anyway. Uh, when they looked at this place, they said, no thanks. Uh, and so, and the idea that modern China would even consider it is absurd. Uh, so, so, yes, um, that, that should be, that undoubtedly is, should be part of our psyche. And I suppose, yes, that can produce a complacency. There's no question about that. But in the past, we have a history that hasn't been complacent. You know, until relatively recently, I grew up in a very poor city, Sydney. It was a grim city, actually. You know, it had wonderful sea, ocean, you could see it. But it was grim. And the disparity now between people in this country, which is not here in Byron, I realize, but you'll understand it. The disparity in modern terms in this country should be enough fuel to end that complacency. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's, it's, one could say complacency almost anywhere. I mean, one goes to the United States and runs into the kind of ignorance about the world that you can think that's complacency. Well, is it? It's, it comes from their history, but when you look back on American history, especially during the two wars, they almost had a revolution in that country. One of the reasons they had, that was quickly dealt with by FDR, and quickly dealt with by the Second World War. Um, you know, people are never still the world is, our history is full of great movements and we inherited many of the great movements from Europe. You mentioned, you mentioned, or the spirit of them, you mentioned the Yellow Jackets in France. I find them absolutely inspirational. The, the French establishment are throwing everything at them. <laughs> in France, of course, the elite there, there's a bit of a history where they get rather nervous <laughs> when the masses start to rise and you know, they start to worry. And I think that's true, actually, particularly the financial elite, which is one of the, which is one of the, one of the nastiest group of humanities you could come across. And this, and this petite royale uh, who's running the country, Macron, is finding himself up against, typically for the French, the most imaginative, the most interesting resistance movement all over the country. God, we need a touch of Gallic here, you know. Uh, <laughs> regardless of the rational, but you know what I mean. Uh, and it, it, it's so, it, people are never still, never still. Uh, Europe, of course, is governed by the point you mentioned, of ge its geography. Yeah. All those countries squeeze between great powers, and, and we are not, yeah. so yes. But we still have the capacity here not to accept, uh, not to accept the kind of leadership. We have a prime minister at the moment, but according to a, what seems like an authentic report recently, was proposing mass detention camps five years ago for up to 30,000 people in Australia. This is the man who devised this, this disgraceful uh, Nauru and Manus uh, concentration camp thing. And a gargoyle like Peter Dutton, you know. Uh, how can we accept these people? Uh, it, it's, that is, that should blow away any complacency. Uh, there we are. There we are. And there, uh, and, and now, and now I'm going to ask President Foundation on behalf of the Angara Institute to thank John, but I just wanted to say personally, John, thank you for your inspirational words. And if there's any legacy that I identify with you, it's that words aren't enough. 
in the end, you just have to do it. So thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you everybody. and stimulating conversation tonight. Thank you so much, Laura. That was fantastic.